The Book of Ephesians Ephesians is addressed to a group of believers who are rich beyond measure in Jesus Christ, yet living as beggars, and only because they are ignorant of their wealth. Since they have yet to accept their wealth, they relegate themselves to living as spiritual paupers. Paul begins by describing in chapters 1 through 3 the contents of the Christian's heavenly bank account. Adoption, acceptance, redemption, forgiveness, wisdom, inheritance, the seal of the Holy Spirit, life, grace, citizenship, in short, every spiritual blessing. Drawing upon that huge spiritual endowment, the Christian has all the resources needed for living to the praise of the glory of his grace. Chapters 4 through 6 resemble an orthopedic clinic where the Christian learns a spiritual walk rooted in his spiritual wealth. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we should walk in them. The traditional title of this epistle is Pros Ephesios, to the Ephesians. Many ancient manuscripts, however, omit an Epheso in Ephesus in chapters 1 verse 1. This has led a number of scholars to challenge the traditional view that this message was directed specifically to the Ephesians. The encyclical theory proposes that it was a circular letter sent by Paul to the churches of Asia. It is argued that Ephesians is really a Christian treatise designed for general use. It involves no controversy and deals with no specific problems in any particular church. This is also supported by the formal tone, no terms of endearment, and distant phraseology after I heard of your faith, chapters 1 verse 15. If they have heard of this message, chapters 3 verse 2. These things seem inconsistent with the relationship Paul must have had with the Ephesians after a ministry of almost three years among them. On the other hand, the absence of personal greetings is not a support for the encyclical theory because Paul would have done this to avoid favoritism. The only letters that greet specific people are Romans and Colossians, and they were addressed to churches Paul had not visited. Some scholars accept an ancient tradition that Ephesians is Paul's letter to the Laodiceans, Colossians 4 verse 16, but there is no way to be sure. If Ephesians began as a circular letter, it eventually became associated with Ephesus, the foremost of the Asian churches. Another plausible option is that this epistle was directly addressed to the Ephesians, but written in such a way as to make it helpful for all the churches in Asia. The author of Ephesians. All internal and external evidence strongly supports the Pauline authorship of Ephesians. In recent years, however, critics have turned to internal grounds to challenge this unanimous ancient tradition. It has been argued that the vocabulary and style are different from other Pauline epistles, but this overlooks Paul's flexibility under different circumstances. Romans and 2 Corinthians. The theology of Ephesians in some ways reflects a later development, but this must be attributed to Paul's own growth and meditation on the church as the body of Christ. Since the epistle clearly names the author in the opening verse, it is not necessary to theorize that Ephesians was written by one of Paul's pupils or admirers, such as Timothy, Luke, Tychicus, or Onesimus. The Time of Ephesians At the end of his second missionary journey, Paul visited Ephesus where he left Priscilla and Aquila, Acts 18. This strategic city was the commercial center of Asia Minor, but heavy silting required a special canal to be maintained so that sh ships could reach the harbor. 
Ephesus was a religious center as well, famous especially for its magnificent temple of Diana or Artemis, a structure considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, Acts 19. The practice of magic and the local economy were clearly related to this temple. Paul remained in Ephesus for nearly three years on his third missionary journey, Acts 18-19. through 19. The word of God was spread throughout the province of Asia. Paul's effective ministry began to seriously hurt the traffic in magic and images, leading to an uproar in the huge Ephesian theater. Paul then left for Macedonia, but afterward he met with the Ephesian elders while on his way to Jerusalem, Acts 20. Paul wrote the prison epistles Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon during his first Roman imprisonment in AD 60-62. These epistles all refer to his imprisonment and fit well against the background in Acts 28. This is especially true of Paul's references to the palace guard, governor's official residential guard, Philippians 1.13 and Caesar's household, Philippians 4.22. Some commentators believe that the imprisonment in one or more of these epistles refers to Paul's Caesarean imprisonment or to a hypothetical Ephesian imprisonment, but the weight of evidence favors the traditional view that they were written in Rome. Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon were evidently written about the same time in AD 60-61. Philippians was written in AD 62, not long before Paul's release. The Christ of Ephesians Paul's important phrase, in Christ, or its equivalent, appears about 35 times, more than in any other New Testament book. The believer is in Christ, in the heavenly places in Christ, chosen in Him, adopted through Christ, in the Beloved, redeemed in Him, given an inheritance in Him, given hope in Him, sealed in Him, made alive together with Christ, raised and seated with Him, created in Christ, brought near by His blood, growing in Christ, a partaker of the promise in Christ, and given access through faith in Him. Keys to Ephesians Key Word Building the Body of Christ Ephesians focuses on the believer's responsibility to walk in accordance with his heavenly calling in Christ Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 1 Ephesians was not written to correct specific errors in a local church, but to prevent problems in the church as a whole by encouraging the body of Christ to maturity in him. It was also written to make believers more aware of their position in Christ, because this is the basis for their practice on every level of life. Key verses Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, and 4, 1 through 3. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Key Chapter Ephesians 6 even though the Christian is blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, chapters 1 verse 3, spiritual warfare is still the daily experience of the Christian while in the world. Chapter 6 is the clearest advice for how to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Chapter 6 verse 10, Survey of Ephesians Paul wrote this epistle to make Christians more aware of their position in Christ and to motivate them to draw upon their spiritual source in daily living. Walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. The first half of Ephesians lists the believer's heavenly possessions, 
adoption, redemption, inheritance, power, life, grace, citizenship, and the love of Christ. There are no imperatives in chapters 1, 3, through 3, which focus only on divine gifts. But chapters 4 through 6 include 35 directives in the last half of Ephesians that speak of the believer's responsibility to conduct himself according to his individual calling. So Ephesians begins in heaven, but concludes in the home and in all other relationships of daily life. The two divisions are the position of the Christian and the practice of the Christian. The position of the Christian, chapters 1 through 3, and the practice of the Christian, chapters 4 through 6. The position of the Christian. After a two verse prologue in one long Greek sentence, Paul extols the triune God for the riches of redemption. Verse 3 through 14. This hymn to God's grace praises the Father for choosing us, the Son for redeeming us, and the Spirit for sealing us. The saving work of each divine person is to the praise of the glory of His grace. Before continuing, Paul offers the first of two very significant prayers. Here he asks that the readers receive spiritual illumination so that they may come to perceive what is, in fact, true. Next, Paul describes the power of God's grace by contrasting their former condition with their present spiritual life in Christ, a salvation attained not by human works, but by divine grace. This redemption includes Jews yet also extends to those Gentiles who previously were strangers from the covenants of promise. In Christ, the two for the first time have become members of one body. The truth that Gentiles would become fellow heirs of the same body was formerly a mystery that has now been revealed. Paul's second prayer expresses his desire that the readers be strengthened with the power of the Spirit and fully apprehend the love of Christ. The Practice of the Christian Chapters 4 through 6 The pivotal verse of Ephesians is chapters 4 verse 1 because it draws a sharp line between the doctrinal and the practical divisions of this book. There is a cause and effect relationship between chapters 1 through 3 and 4 through 6 because the spiritual walk of a Christian must be rooted in his spiritual wealth. As Paul emphasized in Romans, behavior does not determine blessing. Instead, blessing should determine behavior. Because of the unity of all believers in the body of Christ, growth and maturity come from the effective working by which every part does its share. This involves the exercise of spiritual gifts in love. Paul exhorts the readers to put off, concerning your former conduct, the old man and put on the new man that will be manifested by a walk of integrity in the midst of all people. They are also to maintain a walk of holiness as children of light. Every relationship, wives, husbands, children, parents, slaves, and masters must be transformed by their new life in Christ chapters 5 verse 22 through chapter 6 verse 9. Paul's colorful description of the spiritual warfare and the armor of God is followed by a word about Tychicus and then a benediction. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. 
just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, to the praise of his glory. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. Chapter 2 Old Condition Dead to God And you he made alive, who were dead, in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others new condition, alive to God. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Reconciliation of Jews and Gentiles 
Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been made near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of division between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Chapter 3 Revelation of the Mystery of the Church For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power to me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you which is your glory for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit and the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Chapter 4 
Exhortation to Unity I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Explanation of Unity There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Means for unity, the gifts. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Psalm 68 verse 18. Now this he ascended, what does it mean, but that he also first ascended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. The purpose of the gifts for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the son of god to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Put off the old man. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to licentiousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Put on the new man, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness therefore putting away lying each one speak truth with his neighbor for we are members of one another be angry and do not sin do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. 
chapter 5. Therefore, be followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, proving what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is even shameful to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Walk as children of light. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says... Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Isaiah 26, verse 19, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 11. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Be filled with the Spirit. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your husbands. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Chapter 6 Children 
obey your parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Service on the job. Servants, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters do the same things to them, giving up, threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Put on the whole armor of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me the utterance may be given to me, but I may be able to, to open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak but that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing Tychicus a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will make all things known to you whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. The City of Ephesus Ephesus was an important city on the western coast of Asia Minor where the Apostle Paul founded a church. As the most favorable seaport in the Roman province of Asia, this city was the most important trade center west of Tarsus. Today, the city lies in swampy ruins about six miles from the sea because of centuries of silting from the Caister River. During Paul's years in Ephesus, the city was a cultural center with a population of about 300,000 people. Ephesus boasted of a great amphitheater which seated 25,000 people. The city also had a number of gymnasiums, baths, and impressive public buildings. Religion was a prominent feature of life in Ephesus. The Temple of Artemis, or Diana, her Roman name, ranked as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. As the daughter of Zeus, Artemis was variously known as the moon goddess, the goddess of hunting, and the patroness of young girls. The Ephesians took pride in the beautiful temple, 
which was supported by scores of stone columns. The church at Ephesus may have been established by Priscilla and Aquila, Acts 18.18. It was about two years old when Paul settled in the city. Timothy was also involved in ministry at Ephesus, 1 Timothy 1.3. Paul taught daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, Acts 19.9. Influence from Paul's three-year ministry likely resulted in the planting of churches in the Lycus River Valley at Laodicea, Hierapolis, and Colossae. The apostle wrote 1 Corinthians during his Ephesian ministry. Sometime after Paul's ministry, the apostle John settled and ministered at Ephesus. Exiled on the Isle of Patmos, off the coast of Ephesus, he addressed the book of Revelation to the seven churches of Asia Minor, which included the congregation at Ephesus. Revelation chapter 1 verse 11, Revelation chapter 2 verse 1 through 7. The traditional tomb of John is located at the church of St. John in Ephesus. The Purpose of the Church The ultimate purpose of the church is to bring honor and glory to its head, Jesus Christ. It does this as it fulfills its two purposes related to God's program for the world. The one purpose of the church as it relates to the world is evangelism. This program is spelled out in the Great Commission, which has never been rescinded. The program is to make disciples of all the nations. The way this is to be done is twofold, by baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Baptism is not an optional afterthought. It is a vital part of evangelism and making disciples. By baptism, one indicates that he has been identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. For example, he is a member of the universal church, the body of Christ, and wishes to be identified with the local church. A responsible parent not only brings a child into the world, but also provides what is necessary for the child's growth. So in the church, teaching must accompany evangelism so that the child of God can learn all that God expects of him and has provided for him. Another purpose of the church as it relates to the world is edification. According to Ephesians 4.12, the saints need to be edified, built up for two goals, for the equipping of the saints and for the work of the ministry. The believers who compose the church's membership need to be built up so that they may realize all that God has provided for Christian living and that they may come to spiritual maturity. They also need to be equipped to perform that work in the body of Christ that God wants them to perform. In a real sense, each member of the church is to be a Christian worker so that the work that God wants to perform through the local church can be accomplished. The Person of the Holy Spirit Chapter 4, verse 3, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. One of the most serious errors in the minds of many people concerning the Holy Spirit is that He is simply a principle or an influence. On the contrary, the Holy Spirit is as much a person, individual existence of a conscious being, as the Father and the Son. The personality of the Holy Spirit the Bible speaks of the mind and will of the Holy Spirit. He is often described as speaking directly to men in the book of Acts. During Paul's second missionary journey, the apostle was forbidden by the Spirit to visit a certain mission field, Acts 16, verse 6 and 7, and then was instructed to proceed toward another field of service, Acts 16, verse 10. It was God's Spirit who spoke directly to Christian leaders in Antioch Church, commanding them to send Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, Acts 13, verse 2. The deity of the Holy Spirit. He is not only a real person, but he is also God. As is God the Father, he too is everywhere at once, Psalm 139, verse 7. As the Son is eternal, the Holy Spirit has also existed forever Hebrews 9:14 He is often referred to as God in the Bible 
See Acts 5, verse 3 and 4. Finally, the Holy Spirit is equal with the Father and Son. This is seen during the baptism of Christ, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, and is mentioned by Jesus himself just prior to his ascension from the Mount of Olives, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. The work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. Walking in the Spirit. Filling. Chapter 5, verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit is to be controlled by the Spirit, and is therefore crucial to successfully living the Christian life. Unlike the indwelling of the Spirit, Filling is a repeated experience. This is underscored by the use of the present tense, be filled, as well as by biblical examples of Christians who were filled more than once, Acts 2.4 and Acts 4.31. Just as important, we must observe that filling is a command to be obeyed, not an option. The next most important question is, how can someone be filled with the Spirit? The prerequisites are simply confession of sin and yielding to God. The former means to agree with God about the person's sin. The latter means primarily dedication of himself to God. As the believer chooses to obey in these areas, he is filled with the Spirit and enabled to manifest Christ-like character. This obedience may be accompanied by prayer, but is not necessarily so. The certainty of being filled with the Spirit may be confirmed by the believer's faith and life. The believer must of course believe God's word that meeting the conditions will result in the filling. The Spirit-filled person will exhibit the Christ-like character described in Galatians 5.22 and 23 as the fruit of the Spirit. Included in that list are all the vibrant, attractive qualities desired by all Christians. How delightful it is! that any Christian may possess them and be transformed by the filling of the Spirit. The Relationship of the Church to Christ Chapter 5, verse 25 through 29 The wonderful relationship that exists between Christ and the Church was initiated by Christ who loved the Church and gave himself for it. The intimacies of that relationship are described with seven figures, the shepherd and the sheep, the vine and the branches, Christ as high priest, the cornerstone and building stones, the head and many-membered body, the last Adam and new creation, the bridegroom and bride. The shepherd and the sheep emphasizes both the warm leadership and protection of Christ and the helplessness and dependency of believers. John chapter 10, verse 1 through 18. The vine and the branches points out the necessity for Christians to depend on Christ's sustaining strength for growth. John chapter 15, verse 1 through 8. Christ as high priest and the church as a kingdom of priests stresses the joyful worship, fellowship, and service which the church can render to God through Christ. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1 The cornerstone and building stones accents the foundational value of Christ to everything the church is and does, as well as Christ's value to the unity of believers. Love is to be the mortar which solidly holds the living stones together. Ephesians 2 verse 19 through 22 The head and many-membered body is frequently used in scripture to illustrate several tremendous truths. The church is a vibrant organism, 
not merely an organization. It draws its vitality and direction from Christ, the head, and each believer has a unique and necessary place in its growth. The last Adam and new creation presents Christ as the initiator of a new creation of believers as Adam was of the old creation. The bridegroom and bride beautifully emphasizes the intimate fellowship and co-ownership existing between Christ and the church. The role of the parents. Chapter 6 verse 4 And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. The father is the parent responsible for setting the pattern for the child's obedience in the family. Any disciplining the mother does is an extension of the father's authority in the home. The husband and father must take leadership in this area of the family, and the wife and mother must be in submission. The father's responsibility is set forth in two ways. First, what the father is not to do. Do not provoke your children to wrath. He is not to over-discipline them or reign in terror, with the result that the child can only react in a blind outbreak or rage. Second, what the father is to do, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. To bring them up involves three ideas. It is a continuous job. It is a loving job. It is a twofold job involving nurture. It is a continuous job. As long as a child is a dependent, the father is to be responsible for providing for the child so that he becomes what God wants him to be. It is a loving job. To bring up means literally to nourish tenderly. Children should be objects of tender, loving care. It is a twofold job involving nurture, child training, all that a child needs for his development, physically, mentally, and spiritually, and admonition, corrective discipline of the Lord. The father is God's constituted home authority who is to discipline the child when he does not obey as God intends. The father who does not discipline his children is a father who is undisciplined himself and disobedient to God's will. A child's disobedience is not to be tolerated. See Exodus 21, 15-17, Deuteronomy 21, 18-21, Proverbs 13, verse 24, Proverbs 19, 18, Proverbs 22, 15, Proverbs 23, 13, Proverbs 14, 29, verse 15-17.